Hi, welcome back to Books on the Go. I'm Anna and today I'm doing an April wrap up. I think we're into May now, but who knows with the quarantine time, I don't know what day it is anymore, but um, it's better late than never. So these are the books that I read in April. I had quite a good reading month. So starting off with Apple and Knife, by Intan Paramedita, translated by Stephen J. Epstein. This is a really good, vibrant short story collection. And it was it came onto my radar a couple of years ago. I think Liv at the Book Nook had recommended it, or had ordered it at least, and I just saw one or two other people reading it and never quite got there. But then Intan Paramedita spoke at the Jaipur Literary Festival in Adelaide last year. So as part of the Oz Asia Festival in November, the Jaipur Literary Festival comes to Adelaide and they have like a mini, a mini version. And she spoke, she's a really, really interesting, intelligent author and speaker. And so I bought this and I've now also bought her new novel, which I'll talk about next. So I finally got to read it and it's short stories often featuring women, sometimes misbehaving and it uh, contains fairy tale elements and folklore, but it subverts your expectations. And so it's constantly surprising and very original and her writing has a great energy to it. So I really enjoyed this. And then I read, and we're doing this on the podcast, I think soon, The Wandering by Intan Paramedita, again, translated by Stephen J. Epstein or Epstein. And this is her first novel. And it's really, really fun. So this is written as a choose your own adventure, but it's a literary novel. So you're the protagonist and the premise is that you've received a gift from the devil and the gift is a pair of red shoes. And there are some very glamorous red shoes on the cover. And the, but the catch is that you're sort of doomed to wander the world and you won't settle and but you choose where to go and what to do at different points and it becomes when you read a choose I read a few when I was younger but reading a choose your own adventure as an adult it becomes quite existential because it's all about well are you obedient are you going to do the ne- you know you're going to make the next choice based on what the devil has told you to do or are you more curious to explore something else or are you you know you're romantic are you going to stay in New York because you've met Bob and you want to marry him or you know you want to seek more adventure and it's so interesting because you become the character and I had that sense of literally I felt like I was traveling the world so I would go to Berlin then the next you know at the next choice I'd think no no I'm ready to go to Amsterdam now or back to New York or whatever so you you are crisscrossing around the world and there are different endings so I did what I did and this is my tip if you read it is that every time it came to a choice I would put a sticky flag on that page so that I could come back to it because when you get to an ending you sort of need to retrace and then go you want to have a different adventure and so you need to be able to go back to you know where the the paths where there was a fork in the road as it were and so you get a sense it's not like a conventional novel where there's one through line so there's one sort of straight narrative but you do get a sense of the different ways your life could turn out based on choices that you make. And sometimes they seem like a small thing. Like there's one scene where she or you are choosing whether to call someone that night. So you've got home, it's like 11 o'clock and you think it's a bit late to call, but your instinct is maybe that you want to make this phone call or do you wait till the morning? And so it's a small thing, but it, when you obviously can go down both those paths and it's a very different result. So it's really interesting in that way um, and just fun. And again, her writing is is very clean and, and full of energy and it's original. So I found this a refreshing read. And again, she weaves in elements of folklore and fairy tale characters and there's like the gnomes there's a a motif of the garden gnomes and then that links back into snow white or is it yeah snow white and the seven dwarves and things like that so there's a lot 
in this and I think I'm still digesting it but we'll talk about it on the podcast so I'll be able to get my thoughts together by then so that's the wandering and these would also be good for the Asian readathon as would my next one which is the girl who wrote loneliness by Kyung Suk Shin translated by Ha Yun Jung this I ordered last year because Matthew Sharapa had mentioned it for the Women in Translation Month in August. And so I think this was one of the books he'd specified that we could all read. And so I ordered it. I couldn't get it locally and it didn't come quite in time. And so, but it's been on my shelf. And, you know, of course I haven't got to it until now, but um, I finally picked it up and I loved Kyung Suk Shin's book, Please Look After Mother. I thought that was really beautiful and the final scene of that is still with me really really gorgeous read and so I picked this up and Amanda and I did it on the podcast so this is the story of I've forgotten the protagonist's name but it's semi-autobiographical so she states at the beginning this is part not quite fact and not quite fiction and normally I find that off-putting and I think the reason is that I want to be in a story and it's a leap of faith you have to suspend disbelief to really get into a novel. And so I find if the author is then speaking and saying, oh, and this sort of happened, then that takes me out of the fictional world. And I have to really, if you're going to believe in a fictional world, which is a quite an amazing process when you think about it, you have to really be wholeheartedly in it and not be distracted by someone saying oh this really happened or that actually happened to me as well or hello author you know author here so normally that would put me off and it was strange because in this book it didn't and it really worked and it's one that is I think it's a great one to discuss because there's so much going on here so she the basically is telling you the story of the protagonist and I can't think of her name and now I'm wondering if she does get named. I think she probably does. But anyhow, she's telling you the story of the protagonist who as a teenage girl, 16, goes from her country, her village home to work in Seoul in a factory and she lives with her older brother and her cousin. And so she and her cousin both work in this electronics factory and it's that story of how she adapts to that and she's feeling lonely and it's a very tough life so there's one part where she says we didn't get to do things like have you know you couldn't just have friendships make friends let alone have phone calls with your friends like a lot of teenage you know teenagers do go to the cinema anything like that that, that forms a friendship they didn't have time for that that's a real luxury and it you know just makes you think differently when you think back to your teenage years and in a sense those things that were important to you she couldn't do any of that they were just at work and then in the evenings they went to night school and so um, it's very interesting because it gives you this insight into what and it was very much um, orchestrated by the South Korean government that they encouraged their, te their young people to get an education but the cost of them doing that was enormous in the sense of the loneliness, the exhaustion, the mental health impact but they worked in the factory and then for very very little wages lived in tiny cramped apartments and then went to night school and so it just gives you an insight into the being on the front line as it were in that world and, and it's mainly set in 1979 and 1980. Um, there's one girl who's her neighbour and she forms a sort of a very tenuous but very precious friendship with this girl but literally that that friendship is made up of them you know hanging out there washing at the same time maybe dropping off food to one another it's tiny tiny things and walking to the train stop or something like that it's the smallest little elements of her life and that's the only spare time that she might have then in the present she is writing this story but she tells you that she is finding it very hard to write and there's a tragedy that sort of is at the heart of this book that she the author and the who's also the protagonist as a 32 year old woman is resisting telling and so she lets you in on that process and as I said normally I would find that off-putting but somehow 
in this book, it feels very organic and it gives the story more depth and de it's very authentic and it gives it more another layer and somehow it works. I have to say it's slow moving and it's a real slow burn. So this might not be a book if you're distracted a lot in lockdown and things like that. It might not be for that for you know for this time but I found that it really uh, repays it pays off at the end and it was incredibly moving it's one of those books that because she's very precise and understated and so it's it's not overly sentimental when tragedy strikes it has even more impact if you like and again she just tells it in a very understated way but it's all the more beautiful for that so I, this is an interesting one I didn't immediately love it in the way it's not as accessible as please look after mother but I felt like it was a very precious book and she's such an endearing person or the you know the character is so endearing or the the author that you can't help but be charmed by her. And so I felt like there's something very precious about this and it's a very generous book that she's telling you, she's sharing this story with us. So I'd be very interested if you've read it, um, what you thought. So let me know. And again, that would be great for Asian Readathon as well. So then we go, there's a lot of women in translation. So I, this is what happens to me. I do these books that and I don't do them in the right month. So when it comes to August and I have nothing on my shelf by women in translation, we just have to remind ourselves that I did this in April. So this is Vernon Subatex 2 by Virginie Despont and translated by Frank Wynne. And we did this on the podcast recently as well. So I read and loved Vernon Subatex 1, and this is the second book in the trilogy. So we're back with Vernon. He's lost his record store. So he was a record store owner, um, and he's also lost his apartment. So he's now essentially homeless, and we meet him and a series of misfits who band together with him, um, including the hyena who's the former private detective that the film producer has hired to try to get the tapes that Vernon Subatex has of Alex Bleach who's the rock star and Lauren Doppelay the film producer is really worried about what's on these tapes and that really is the only thing of value that Vernon has left and the hyena's been on the case so she returns there's Pamela Kant the former porn star there's a tattoo artist there's a neo-nazi it's a motley crew and they are in the park and they're at the local cafe and each one of them tells a chapter so you get a chapter from different perspectives and it's just there's something about Virginie Despont's writing that is so immersive and so interesting so that even when the plot is quite slow it really propels you forward and I love that about this I felt like I and just the amount of detail the realness of it it's very authentic and I felt as if I was in Paris and certainly not the glamorous picture postcard Paris but a side of Paris that you don't normally see and certainly don't see in fiction or in literature and she's spoken about that she wants to write books about the ugly ugly people for the ugly people that she never sees when she's reading so there's a lot in this and she also weaves in philosophy and rock and roll and lots of music and it just is infused with this rock and roll lifestyle and diverse characters so I loved that I thought it was a bit more loose compared to the first book in the trilogy so it's not as tight as that first book and it does get a little bit exaggerated in terms of towards the end but um, you just go with it because she's such an engaging writer. So I really recommend this. And the third one I think is about to come out maybe in June. I think I'll read that just to see how it all wraps up. So that's Vernon Subatex number two. And then I read The Glass Hotel, the much anticipated Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. So I read her novel Station Eleven a couple of years ago and really loved it and there's something very warm and engaging about her tone her writing so even though station 11 was quite a dystopic novel which normally puts me off 
I just actually loved the characters and so that kept me going and similarly here she just conjures up scenes that are so real that you are right there and you're going with those characters so this is about a series of people who are caught up in a Bernie Madoff type of Ponzi scheme and it implodes and then what happens so we have the main character is Vincent and she is the wife of the Bernie Madoff character, Jonathan. So she goes from being not very well off and living in grungy Vancouver to a very much the high life in New York. And there are some fun scenes of her lounging by the pool with her friend Morella. And it's quite the sort of the trophy wife lifestyle. But then of course it doesn't um, that doesn't last forever, as we know, um, because the scheme implodes. And we know from early on that Jonathan ends up in jail. So that's not a plot spoiler. The structure is very interesting. It's quite fragmented and it's been described as kaleidoscopic, which I think is quite accurate because you just get it jumps from scene to scene. So it'll, it's almost like if you were sort of hovering with a camera and you go down to the scene every now and then. So you'll be down by the pool with Vincent and Morella and then it'll hover back to jail and you'll be with Jonathan in jail. And it also, that's going back and forth a little bit with time. I didn't mind that because she's so strong with setting the scene that you're immediately, you know where you are with Emily St. John Mandel. And when you're in jail, you know exactly what's happening and you know that it's Jonathan and you're getting an insight into him. And likewise, when you're with Vincent's brother, I think it's Paul, for example, um, there's a great scene where they're both working behind the bar at this glamorous hotel, which is on Vancouver Island called the, and I think that's the, the glass hotel because it's this sort of glass and cedar, beautiful wilderness adjacent, as the manager says, not, you know, people want to be in the wilderness, but they don't want to be in the wilderness. They want to be sort of next to it. And that's so true. So there are a lot of little, very astute observations like that, that she weaves in. Um, and again, you know, you're right there. You feel like you're behind the bar or sitting at the bar at that hotel and Vincent's drying glasses and Walter's going to move pot plants because someone scratched some graffiti on the glass. So he's sort of moving plants around to try to hide this graffiti. And it's so firmly sort of she sets the scene so firmly and there's lovely sort of dialogue and, as I said, really well observed um, so I loved that, but it didn't, it was interesting. So I just found it thoroughly enjoyable, but Annie didn't love it because she said for her, it didn't quite come together. And it was interesting because then when I was reflecting back on it, I thought, no, I don't know if it does quite come together. I don't know if the sum of the parts is more than I don't know if the whole is more than the sum of the parts or whatever this, I don't know what the saying is, but you know, she said there was a review that described it as a jigsaw puzzle without the box. And for me, the mainly what it meant was in terms of the structure that I didn't really care about the characters. It was sort of rich white people problems. And even Jonathan, who is really the villain of the piece, was quite bland. I don't know. I just thought he'd be a bit more arrogant or something. Just there'd be something more to him. Vincent is the most sympathetic in that she's the one we really follow. And, you know, again, there wasn't much. I couldn't quite care, you know, if she... I couldn't really care what happened to her in a sense. So that was interesting. That's probably my only criticism, but just as a really beautifully written, fun read, I would recommend it. So then this one, which I absolutely loved, A Month in Siena by Hisham Matar. And I talked about this recently in a episode of the podcast that we'll be uploading next week which is our isolation read tips so this is one that I recommend for this time because it is such a beautiful escape and it's also short so Hisham Matar wrote The Return so he was born in New York City to Libyan parents and he lived in Cairo um, his father was taken when he was young and he never saw him again and he went back to Libya was it when he was about 30 or 40 and 
just to come to terms with the fact that he won't probably won't ever see his father again his father's probably died but you know he's disappeared and so he wrote a book called the return about his time going back to Libya and it was a sort of part memoir and part narrative non-fiction about the regime in Libya and and what was happening um, during those years and I loved that book. It was really beautifully written, quite philosophical, but also it tells you also his personal story. So he tells you in this book, he's always loved the Sienese School of Art. So the artists who were in Siena in about the third, I'm going to say 13th or 14th century. I always get this wrong by about 100 years, but he's always loved this art and he'd never been to Siena. So when he finished the return, when he finished writing the return, he decided to have a month off and he came to Siena and this is just the account of his month in Siena and that's it's really that simple and it is so beautiful because it weaves in the artworks that he goes to see and he actually does give you I'll see if I can find one he does include there I don't know if that if you can see that he does include the pictures of the artworks so for people like me who are not immediately familiar with the titles of the paintings um, it's really beautiful reference to have within the book and he also just tells you what he does during the day so each day he might go to one of the museums or the churches he paces himself in terms of seeing them on different days and he also meets a couple of interesting people and goes to dinner uh, makes a new friend and it's quite simple in that way which is why I think it's so lovely to read at the moment when people are feeling sometimes anxious or distracted because it is there's something that's very calming about this book and he also talks about how normally he feels other than with a few exceptions he normally feels out of time and he feels like he should be somewhere else or doing something else and he said the whole month that he was in Siena he felt in time and that that was where he was meant to be so there's and that sort of infuses the book as well so I really recommend this it just has a smattering of art philosophy memoir um, you know travel memoir and just and an escape to Siena, which we can't visit at the moment. So I really, really loved it. So that's A Month in Siena by Hisha Matar. And last but not least, An American Sunrise, the poems of Joy Harjo. And I just did this on the podcast with Jenny from Reading Envy, and we both absolutely loved it. So I don't read a lot of poetry, so this is outside my comfort zone, but Joy Harjo is such an icon. She's the Poet Laureate of the United States. She's also a musician. She's multi-talented and she's from the Muscogee Creek Nation and she came to Adelaide for Adelaide Writers Week and so I intended to go to that session and I bought this book which is just a beautiful object. I didn't managed to get to the session but I've listened to it since on the podcast which you can download I think if you google Adelaide Writers Week Joy Harjo or something like that she's so interesting and so Jenny and I thought we'd do this for National Poetry Month which was in April and the poems tell the story of the forced movement of the Muscogee Creek people from the east of the Mississippi, so the southeastern states like Alabama and Georgia, to what is now Oklahoma. And it's called the Trail of Tears, but as she points out, there are more than one Trail of Tears. So she sort of traces that journey. She goes back to her, the land that belongs to her people, and she writes about that, and she also intersperses it with small paragraphs from archives or history or her reflections and I found that really lovely to break it up and also to give you you know she doesn't assume that you know all this stuff which is good especially for me being in Australia we don't learn much about this at all at school or otherwise so I found that really good um, and the poems are beautiful and some of them more personal and some of them about the land that it's very accessible but it's also very rich and there's it gives you a lot to think about so Jenny and I both thought we might need to read it more than once I think and even though it's a very slim book um, and as I said quite easy to read quite accessible it's I think it would pay 
you know, rereading. So that is An American Sunrise by Joy Harjo. And that's it for the month of April. Let me know what you've been reading and I will see you soon. Bye for now.